Now this morning we continue to look at John's discussion of the true children of God, considering verses 4 through the middle of verse 10 of chapter 3, under the title of the true children of God, their sin and righteousness. And we will look at that portion under the following headings, which I have written on the board. First of all, the incompatibility of sin. Secondly, the impossibility of sin. And then thirdly, the conclusion concerning sin and righteousness. First of all, then, the incompatibility of sin. Now, in the previous section, as we saw last week, John has made it clear that the true children of God practice, and there's a key word, you'll be hearing it over and over again, the true children of God practice righteousness. Notice what he says in verse 29 of 1 John chapter 2. He says, if you know that he, that is God, is righteous... You know also that everyone who practices righteousness has been begotten of God. Then notice in verse 3 of chapter 3. Everyone who has this hope set on him, that is Christ, is purifying himself even as Christ is pure. So in this immediate context, in addition to several very clear statements earlier in this letter, in this immediate context... John says that the true child of God lives a life which is characterized by righteousness. A true child of God lives a life which is characterized by continually purifying himself, even as Christ is pure. Now, beginning in verse 4 of chapter 3, John approaches the same issue, but from the opposite perspective. Instead of addressing the subject of the child of God and righteousness, now John shifts the emphasis to the child of God and sin. And the point he's trying to make in verses 4 through 8 is that being a true child of God and living a life of sin are incompatible. That's the point he's trying to make in verses 4 through 8. That being a true child of God on one hand and living a life of sin on the other hand, those two things, says John in this section, are incompatible. Notice what he says in verse 4. He says, Everyone that does sin does also lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So he's teaching us that the true child of God and living a life of sin are incompatible, first of all, because of the nature of sin. And he says that being a true child of God and living a life of sin are incompatible because of what sin is. Notice again verse 4. Everyone that does sin does also lawlessness, and sin is Lawlessness. The first thing we need to notice is this word translated does or doeth in some translations. It's used two times in this verse. Everyone that does sin does also lawlessness. Now, the word does here is the standard Greek word which means to do, poieo. But the thing I want you to notice is that this is another one of those present tense verbs. I know you're getting tired of hearing about present tense verbs. I know you're getting tired of hearing about the Greek tenses. But in the letter of First John, a correct understanding of the Greek tenses is absolutely essential for a correct understanding of what the apostle is seeking to communicate. So I do not apologize for pointing out the Greek tenses, because I want you to understand what God is saying through the apostle. And unless I do this, you will not understand it. So here we have another one of those present tense verbs. And remember, a present tense verb denotes continuing activity. The doeth sin in this verse is not a one-time act of sin. And it is not even an occasional sin. In this verse, John is speaking of the continuing activity of sinning. He is speaking of habitual sinning. 
He is speaking of a lifestyle which is characterized by the ongoing practice of sin. He says, everyone that practices sin is practicing lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And the next thing we need to look at is this word lawlessness. It's the Greek word for law, which is nomos, with the alpha prefix attached to it. So our word here is anomos, which literally means no law or without law, or the absence of law. So what John is saying here is everyone who practices sin is practicing no lawness. Literally, that's what he's saying. Everyone who practices as an ongoing practice of life, sin is practicing no lawness. One who is practicing sin is acting as if there was no law. One who is practicing sin is refusing to acknowledge that the God of the universe has given us His law. One who is practicing sin is refusing to conform to the law of God, refusing to conform to the standard of God. The Word of God is the God-given standard by which man is to function. And John is saying that one who is practicing as a habitual way of life, that the practice of habitual sinning is the ignoring of this God-given standard, is the ignoring of the revealed will of God and the putting of our own will in its place. It is man doing his own thing as if there was no law. A life of habitual sinning, says John, is no lawness. The point John is seeking to make is that being a true child of God and living a sinful lifestyle is incompatible because habitual sinning is a refusal to conform to the standard of of the one whose child we profess to be. That's his point. That's his point. That being a true child of God and living a sinful lifestyle is incompatible because habitual sinning is a refusal to conform to the standard of the one whose child we profess to be. To say, God is my father... And to say, I am his child, and then habitually ignore what he has to say about how I live, John says, is just not compatible. It's inconsistent for a member of God's family to ignore God's law. It's inconsistent for a member of God's family to ignore the rules of the family. That's the point that he's making. Being a child of God. And practicing sin is incompatible, first of all, says John, because of the nature of sin. Sin is lawlessness. Sinning is living as if the one you call your father has given you no law. But then after pointing out this incompatibility because of the nature of sin... Beginning in verse 5, John points out this incompatibility because of the work and the person of Christ. First of all, because of the work of Christ. Notice what he says in verse 5. And you know that he, and the he here is Christ, and you know that he was manifested to take away sins. And you know that he, that is Christ, was manifested to take away sins. Now, the word manifested here can be literally translated made known. John's main point here has to do with why Christ was made known. And he says he was made known henna in order that or in order to take away sins. The henna introduces a purpose clause. He was made known, says John, for a purpose. Why, would, why did he come into the world? Why the incarnation? Why the second person of the Trinity was made known through the virgin's womb in the incarnation? John says it was for a purpose. 
And what was that purpose? For what reason did the triune Godhead make known the second person of the Trinity to the virgin's womb? Why the incarnation of the eternal Christ? John says, in order to take away sins. And that word, take away, the Greek word, iro, simply means to bear or to carry or to remove. John reminds his readers that Christ came to take away sins. Now, why did John say this? That seems to come right out of the blue. It seems to have no relation to what he has just said. Why did he say this? Well, remember what John is doing here. He's seeking to persuade his readers that being a true child of God and habitual sinning is incompatible. And he has already pointed out that it is incompatible because sin is lawlessness. Now he adds these two things are incompatible because continuing in sin is diametrically opposed to what Christ came to do. It's diametrically opposed to what Christ came to do. He came to take away sin. It was sin that caused his suffering. It was sin that caused his death. And to do anything but to hate sin and to flee from sin and to mortify sin is to be at odds with the Christ who came to take away sin. Certainly a lifestyle of habitual sinning. A lifestyle of the ongoing practice of sin would be at cross purposes with the Son of God. And for one to profess to be a follower of Christ while willingly, consciously embracing that which killed Christ, John says, is totally inconsistent, incompatible. But then from there he moves on to the person of Christ. Notice again verse 5. And you know that Christ was made known in order to take away sins. And in him is no sin. Or more literally, and sin in him is not. In this clause, the word sin is placed first in order to emphasize sin. And in him sin is not. Now, John's readers professed to be disciples of Christ. And again, let me remind you that John here is seeking to demonstrate the incompatibility of continuing in sin on one hand and being a disciple of Christ on the other. And to do that, he points out Christ's relationship to sin, with the point being that a disciple of someone should relate to something as his master does. A disciple of Christ should relate to sin as does his master. And what is the master's relationship to sin? Well, with the word sin placed first in the original for emphasis, John says, and sin in him is not. John's point being that to profess to be a child of God, to profess to be a disciple, a follower of Christ, And continue in sin is incompatible because the one you say you are following not only came for the purpose of taking away sins, but he personally has no sin. The conclusion being, if you're really a follower of Christ, you will seek to be like Christ and you will reject sin as well. And you certainly, certainly will not embrace sin as the habitual practice of your life. And this point John makes very clear when he comes to his conclusion to this section in verse 6. Notice what he says in verse 6. Whosoever abides in him sins not. Whosoever sins has not seen him neither knows him. Now, in order to correctly understand what John is saying here, we must again notice the Greek verbs that John uses. 
And again, the pertinent Greek verbs are present tense verbs. And remember, present tense verbs denote continuing, ongoing activity. Present tense verbs denote habitual behavior. Most of our English Bibles do not include this habitual aspect in their translation of this passage. And because of that, this passage has been either misunderstood or ignored altogether. John's readers would have understood what he is saying because Greek was their native language. But universally poor English translations have greatly hampered the English-speaking world from understanding what John is saying here. John is not saying, whosoever abides in Christ does not sin. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying, whosoever sins has not seen Christ, neither knows Christ. John is not speaking of sinless perfection. And that's the way most of our English translators uh, seem to have not what they understood, but the way they've translated it. He's already said back in verse 8 of chapter 1, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So he's not speaking of sinless perfection. Both of these verbs, which are built upon the root word which means to sin, are present tense verbs denoting continuing habitual activity. John is saying to his readers, whosoever abides in Christ does not practice sin. That's what he's saying. Whosoever abides in Christ does not habitually sin. Whosoever abides in Christ does not sin as a pattern of his life. Whosoever abides in Christ does not live a sinful lifestyle. Whosoever practices sin has not seen Christ, neither knows Christ. Whosoever habitually sins has not seen Christ, neither knows Christ. Whosoever sins as a pattern of life has not seen Christ, neither knows Christ. John is not saying that unless one is without sin, he is not a true child of God. He is saying one who has a pattern of life habitually sins. One who has a pattern of life does not conform to God's word and God's law. That person, says John, is not abiding in Christ. That person has not seen Christ. That person does not know Christ. Three terms which speak of, speaks of one being savingly joined to Christ. Different ways of saying that that person is not a Christian. Then in verse 7, he commands his readers to reject anyone who would teach them differently. Notice what he says in verse 7. My little children, let no man lead you astray. He that is doing, another present tense verb, he that is practicing righteousness is righteous, even as he that is Christ is righteous. Clearly, this is a reference to those that John calls antichrists. Believing that sin was an activity of this inherently evil physical body, And that sin could in no way contaminate the good spirits of men, these early Gnostic false teachers made no effort to refrain from sinning. They felt very comfortable professing to be children of God while living in habitual rebellion against the law of God. And they were teaching by precept and by example that one's relationship with God was in no way affected by their continuing patterns of sin. Here John commands his readers not to be led astray by such teaching. The word translated lead astray is a present imperative. John is commanding his readers to continue to refuse to be led astray. I command you, he said, to continue to refuse to be led astray. Do not let men lead you astray on this issue of how a sinful lifestyle relates to your profession of being a child of God. Relates to your profession of being a disciple of Christ. Because, says John, as he points his readers to the one they profess to serve, he that practices righteousness is righteous. Righteous. 
even as Christ is righteous. The point he is making is that true disciples of Christ will be like Christ. And if he is righteous, the true child of God being like him will also practice righteousness. So again, John demonstrates the incompatibility of being a true child of God and a lifestyle of nonconformity to the law of God. These two things are incompatible, says John, because Christ was made known not for the purpose of leaving you comfortable in your sins. Christ was manifested for the purpose of taking away sins, for removing sins. And these things are also incompatible because the one you profess to follow Himself has no sin. Don't be led astray. Don't be led astray. If you are really his disciples, you will be righteous, says John, as he is righteous. In the family of God, the children of God will be like the Son of God. That's his point. Any other way, says John, is inconsistent. Any other way is incompatible. Now that John has demonstrated this incompatibility, the incompatibility of being a true child of God and a life of habitual sinning, now that he has demonstrated this incompatibility by pointing at the nature of sin, then secondly pointing at the work and the person of Christ, in verse 8 he demonstrates this incompatibility by reminding his readers of the source of, of sin. Notice verse 8 of 1 John chapter 3. He that does sin is of the devil. For the devil is sinning from the beginning. To this end was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. He that does sin is of the devil. For the devil is sinning from the beginning. To this end was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Again, this word does at the beginning of the verse is a present tense verb. Would be better translated the one who is doing sin. That gives it more of the continuing flavor. The one who is doing sin. John is still speaking about those who continually, habitually sin. He is speaking of those who, as a pattern of life, refuse to conform to the Word of God. He that is practicing sin would be a better translation. That person, says John, who is habitually sinning, is of the devil. And when John says that person is of the devil, he is saying he is of the character of the devil. Not necessarily to the same degree, but of the same stripe and of the same bent as the devil. Such one, says John, is following the lead of the devil. Just like one who is a true child of God is righteous as God is righteous. Following God's lead in righteousness, a true child of God is righteous. Now John says one who is a child of the devil is sinful just like the devil, following the lead of the devil. And that's what Jesus meant when he said to the Jews in John chapter 8, in verse 44, you are of your father, the devil. He didn't mean that the devil had somehow given birth to them. He meant that they were manifesting the same sinful characteristics as the devil. Just like one who is in the family of God manifests the family trait of righteousness, one who is in the family of Satan manifests the family trait of sinfulness. So he's making that comparison. And then he adds, the devil is sinning from the beginning. Another present tense verb, Satan's habitual activity, his ongoing activity since sin entered the creation at the time of his fall has been sinning. He is continuing to sin and that from the beginning, says John. And those who are in his family, those who are following his lead, 
are those who are doing exactly what he has been doing all along. And that is practicing sin. So do you see the point John is making? Nothing could be more incompatible. Nothing could be more incompatible than to be a true child of the righteous God while at the same time habitually following the ways of a sinful devil. Can you see the incompatibility in that? Professing to be a true child of the righteous God while at the same time practicing that which, is, that which originated in a sinful devil. Totally incompatible, says John. Nothing could be more incompatible. And to make its incompatibility more clear, John adds this at the end of that verse. To this end was the Son of God made known in order that he might destroy the works of the devil. The same point that he made back up in verse 5 except with different language. Notice in verse 5. And you know that he was made known in order to take away sins. The very purpose for which the Son of God came into the world was to take away sins. To take away the sins which these false teachers are telling you that it's okay to live in. Now John, stating the same thing from another perspective, says that he came into the world for the purpose for the purpose of destroying the works of the devil. To destroy the works of the devil which these false teachers are telling you that it's okay to live in. John's point is that that is inconsistent. If it were okay for the child of God to live in sin, then why was the Son of God sacrificed to take away sin? And if it's okay for the child of God to be involved in, in, in doing the works of the devil, if it's okay for the child of God to follow the lead of the devil, then why was the Son of God sacrificed in order to destroy the works of the devil? John is seeking to point out the incompatibility of a true child of a righteous God habitually following the ways of a sinful devil. And he could not make it any clearer. Then in this verse, when he says, He that practices sin is of the devil, for the devil is sinning from the beginning. For this very reason was the Son of God manifested, for the purpose that he might destroy the works of the devil. The reason he came was to destroy that which your teachers are telling you it's okay to live in. John says that is incompatible. Now that the Apostle has pointed out the incompatibility of sin, he moves on to address the impossibility of sin. Notice what he says in verse 9. Whosoever is begotten of God does not sin, because his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin, because he is begotten of God. Whosoever is begotten of God does not sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is begotten of God. In this verse, John makes two statements of fact. The two main verbs here are in the indicative mood, which is the mood which is used to make an assertion or a statement of fact. John is not telling his readers what it is their duty to do. He's not suggesting what he hoped they would do. And he's not even stating what they should do. John here is making two statements of facts as to what those who have been born of God actually do do. That's what he's doing here. And notice it is not just some of the children of God which are described here. John, what John says applies to all those who have been born of God. He says, whosoever is begotten of God. A more literal translation, everyone who has been begotten of God. So John, by inspiration of the Spirit, leaves no room for other true children of God who are not characterized by what he says here. 
He leaves no room for there to be another category of the children of God. What he says here, he says, applies to everyone who has been begotten of God. He begins this verse with the Greek word pos, which means all. Now notice what he says about all who have been born of God. Notice what he says about all who have had the new birth. He says, everyone who has been born of God does not sin. That's a fact, says John. That's a fact. And his readers would have understood that he was stating a fact. John says, it is a fact that everyone who has been begotten of God does not sin. But wait a minute, John. Wait a minute. You just said in chapter 1 that we all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. In chapter 2, you made it very clear that you assumed that we were from among the children of God. But now you're contradicting yourself by saying, if we're really born of God, we will not sin. Or in chapter 1, you said, we all do sin. John, you're contradicting yourself. But you see, that's not what John is saying. He is not saying, whosoever is begotten of God does no sin. The word translated does is another present tense verb, which speaks of continuing habitual activity. And the proper translation would be, everyone who has been begotten of God does not practice sin. That's a proper translation. A statement of fact. Not that they should not practice sin. Not that they will someday not practice sin. Sin, but a statement of present reality which includes every last person who has truly received a spiritual birth from God. Every one who has been born of God does not practice sin. That's the first statement of fact. To that, John adds the reason that this is so. In making reference to what some have called the new life principle, which is implanted at the new birth and most likely a reference to the Holy Spirit, John gives a reason why the, why the one begotten of God does not practice sin when he says, because his seed remains in him. Now, the commentators debate the issue as to what or who this seed is. And that would be a very interesting study. But since our time is limited and a correct understanding of that issue does not affect John's main point one bit, we're going to move on then to John's second statement of fact. Not only is it a fact, says John, that everyone who has been begotten of God does not practice sin. Secondly, he says, and he cannot sin because he is begotten of God. And he cannot, there's the key word, and he cannot sin because he is begotten of God. It's not just a fact, says John, that everyone who has been begotten of God does not sin. John says it's also a fact that because they are born of God, they cannot practice sin. They cannot practice sin. Literally, John says, and he is not able to practice sin because he has been born of God. Here John uses the word, a word of, a, of ability. The word is dunamai, which means to be able. And the word translated sin is another present tense verb denoting continual habitual activity. And by inspiration of the Spirit of God himself, John is clearly teaching that even though a true Christian does commit acts of sin, 1 John 1, 8, because of the changes wrought by God in the new birth, a true child of God no longer has the ability to live in ongoing sin as a pattern of life. That's the point that he's making. Even though, according to 1 John 1, 8, a true child of God does continue to commit acts of sin. He says here that a true child of God, because of the changes wrought in him by God at the new birth, no longer has the ability to live in ongoing sin as a pattern 
of life. He cannot practice sin because he has been begotten of God. So not only are being a true child of God, while at the same time living a life of habitual nonconformity to the word of God incompatible, being a true child of God, while at the same time living a life of habitual nonconformity to the word of God, John says, is impossible. Impossible. According to the Spirit of God who knows all things, There is no such person as one who is a true child of God and a habitual sinner at the same time. There is no such person. The Apostle John, inspired by the Spirit of God himself, says this is impossible. Those two things, says John, are not only incompatible, they are impossible. Now that John has laid the groundwork by pointing out the incompatibility of sin for the true child of God, secondly, the impossibility of sin for the true child of God, in verse 10, John states his conclusion. Notice what he says in the first part of verse 10. In this, the children of God are made known, and the children of the devil. Whosoever does righteousness or does not righteousness is not of God. In this the children of God are made known and the children of the devil. Whosoever does not righteousness is not of God. John's conclusion. And remember, these are not John's words. These are the words of God himself, not just the thoughts of God himself, but the actual words of God himself. God's conclusion through his servant John is that there is a way to determine who is in the family of God and who is in the family of the devil. That's what God says, that there is a way to determine who's in God's family and who's in the devil's family. There is something which distinguishes them from each other. There is a way of knowing if one is a child of God or a child of the devil. He says, in this, the children of God are made known and the children of the devil. And what is it that distinguishes these two families? John says, whosoever does not righteousness is not of God. Or more literally, everyone not practicing righteousness, he is not of God. There's that all-inclusive term again. All or every. No room for exceptions. And there's another one of those present tense verbs. Everyone who is not doing or everyone who is not practicing righteousness. Continual, habitual activity. Everyone who is not Practicing righteousness as a pattern of life, John says, is not of God. Everyone who is not habitually conforming to the word of God is not of God. John could not have stated it any clearer. He could not have stated it any clearer. Each of these two families have distinguishing family characteristics. And these characteristics are so much different from each other that the presence or absence of these characteristics are an accurate barometer of determining which family a person is in. That's what John is saying. If a person lives in habitual conformity to God's standard as revealed in God's word, John says he is a child of God. If a person does not live in habitual conformity to the revealed will of God, he is a child of the devil. A very clear and unambiguous conclusion. Now, in this portion of John's letter, in an effort to refute the heresies of these false teachers, and also in an effort to restore to his readers the joy of their salvation, John addresses this subject of the true children of God, their sin and righteousness. 
First of all, he pointed out the incompatibility between being a true child of God and living an ongoing sinful life. Then he pointed out the impossibility of being a true child of God and living a sinful life. And then, as we have just seen, he came to a very clear conclusion. One who habitually conforms to the word of God is a child of God. One who does not habitually conform to the word of God is a child of the devil with absolutely nothing in between, no exceptions. Now, I ask you who are here this morning. Whose family are you in? Whose family are you in? Are you a child of God? Or are you a child of the devil? Which family characteristic describes you? Which of the family characteristics that have been pointed out by the Apostle John describes you? Are you habitually conforming to the revealed will of God as revealed in His Word? Are you habitually conforming to what God has revealed in His Word? Not are you perfectly conforming to the Word of God. I know that that is not the case because John clearly says if we have no sin, speaking of himself as an apostle as well, we deceive ourselves. So I'm not asking are you perfectly conforming. I'm asking are you habitually as a pattern of life, as a practice of life, conforming to the revealed will of God as laid out in the Scriptures. The standard which God has set for your family life. Are you conforming to that? Do you as husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church even when they are not lovable because that is the standard God has set for you? And you as wives, are you in subjection to your husbands as the church is subject to Christ? And are you respecting your husbands even when they have not earned your respect because that is the standard that God has set for you? And you fathers, are you embracing your responsibility to nurture your children by chastening and admonition even when you do not have the time because that is the standard that God has set for you? What about the standard which God has set for our spiritual lives? Are you faithful? in your use of the means of grace, faithful in the daily study of God's standard, faithful in that secret place of prayer, faithful in family worship, faithful in meeting with the people of God at the appointed times, because that is the standard that God has set for you. And we could go on and on. What about God's revealed standard in the workplace? What about God's revealed standard in your relationships with your brethren? Your relationships with the unconverted? Your relationships even with your enemies? What about God's standard concerning this world's goods? The list is endless because God has addressed every area of His life or every area of our lives in His revealed standard. He's addressed it all. And the question is, are you habitually conforming to the revealed will of God as contained in the Scriptures or not? That's the question. That's a crucial question. When John says, in this the children of God are made known and the children of the devil, he says absolutely nothing about the test being one's profession of faith. He says absolutely nothing about the test being one's agreement with a list of theological principles. He says absolutely nothing about the test being one's baptism or local church membership. He says absolutely nothing about the test being one's contributions to the offering plate. The test is if you are living a life of habitual conformity to the Word of God, or if you're not living a life of habitual conformity to the Word of God. 
And John says there are no exceptions. Everyone, everyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. Now, many in our day are just like the false teachers of John's day. And they will tell you that a simple confession of belief in Christ will secure your salvation, even though there is absolutely no evidence of turning from sin. That's the position of most broad evangelicals. The Spirit of God, through his servant John, in this passage, says that is not so. That is not so. If you are not as a pattern of life, striving for conformity to the Word of God according to God Himself, no matter what you profess, you are not His child. You are a child of the devil. No matter what you profess. On the other hand, if you are involved in an ongoing struggle to be more and more conformed to the revealed will of God, According to this passage, this is evidence that you are a true child of God. May God help us to examine ourselves, not by some man-made standard, but by this very clear standard from the Word of God. This is not ambiguous, folks. It's not ambiguous. You don't have to be a mental, theological giant to understand this principle. It's very clear. John had a way of doing that, making things very, very clear. Let's examine ourselves by this standard. May God help us. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this, your word, which is so clear. Now, Father, as we have seen how this has been distorted through the centuries, even in translations into the English language, and how it has been distorted in much of modern religious thinking, we know how important this is, our Father, because we know that Satan would not seek to destroy such clear teaching if it was not such an assault on his kingdom. Our Father, we ask that you would help us Help us to examine ourselves in light of this very clear word through your servant John, but from you. Help us to examine ourselves and seek with judgment day honesty to determine if our lives are habitual conformity to your revealed will. Or if we're not concerned for your word and we're going about doing our own will. Help us, our Father, to examine ourselves in light of these truths. And for those who are not consistently serving you and consistently being conformed to your word, cause them to see that their profession is empty. And cause them to turn to the only hope for lost sinners, the Lord Jesus, and turn from their sin and be determined the rest of their days to be more and more conformed to your word. Bless us, our Father, as we continue now through this day. Meet with us. Help us, we pray in Christ's name.